the Marysville John Doe, identified as Michael Allen Holliber. This one begins in Marysville, Pennsylvania on March 27, 2014. It was at this time remains were found on state game lands, and the man was believed to be probably 45 to 70. He was 5'1 to 6'6, six, six, or 180 to 198 centimeters. While those were somewhat wide estimates, they did know that he had injured his right ankle and at some point had required surgery and a screw implanted to fix that ankle. None of it included anything, unfortunately, to pinpoint what his name was. The COD was ruled to be a gunshot wound to his head, and therefore it was determined that someone took his life. In 2022, they would team with Othram Labs to determine if they could get DNA that was suitable for a genetic genealogy. A lot of these cases have really hard DNA, but they've pulled successful DNA from burn victims and other things. It's actually pretty amazing. And Othram Labs is the one that seems to have led the entire charge. If anyone could get a DNA profile suitable for genetic genealogy, it was probably them, and it did work. They were able to find a distant relative of Michael Allen Holliber. Michael disappeared from Strasburg, Virginia in 2012, which was a couple of years before his remains were found. He would have been 47 years old the year that his remains were found. And in this case, they have who did it. James Callahan was arrested in Strasburg, Virginia. They believe he took Michael's life and transported him to the area where he was found. Michael was officially identified in February of 2023, but it was the end of September in 2023 when Callahan was arrested for the crime. Michael's brother came forward to say he's been tearful, but is very thankful to know what happened. He did ask that people call the police if they know anything more about what happened to his brother. There's a number on the screen for Pennsylvania Crime Stoppers. Michael Holliber was missing for 11 years, and he was an unidentified John Doe for nine. He was found 154 miles, or 248 kilometers from home. Had he lived, he would be 58 years old today. The new Brighton Jane Doe, identified as Gail Marlene Johnson. This story begins on September 15, 2000, when two teens were out for a walk in New Brighton, Minnesota. On September 15, 2000, two teens were out for a walk in Long Lake Regional Park, and it was here in a marshy area that they would discover an unidentified woman. Upon examination, they would estimate she'd been there probably about two months. They would reach out to the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, or the BCA, and they would employ forensic scientists who would successfully obtain DNA. But once they processed it, there was no match in CODIS. Another mystery was even what happened, especially as the COD couldn't be determined. They would report, however, that they considered it, at the very least, suspicious. So with the DNA dead end, that meant they would need to go back to the DNA drawing board and get a more in-depth profile. For this, they went to Astria Forensics, and they would get DNA needed for genetic genealogy. It's a different type, and it's a lot more expensive, so they do the first route and then through CODIS first. So if you're missing a family member, you should always contact NamUs in order to donate your DNA. As they went through genetic genealogy, they would finally settle on the Johnson family tree. They began digging into different relationships within that tree, which led to a confirmation on a connection with a missing person named Gail Johnson. They need information in order to work on what happened to Gail. She drove a black or a gray 1989 Ford Mustang at the time. She was an escort who was working along Lake Street in Minneapolis when she disappeared. Her last known interaction with law enforcement was on July 11, 2000, and it was at this time that she was age 40. So if anyone has any idea what happened to her, please call the number given. I usually opt not to include police photos if I can help it, but it seems unwise to ask people to come forward and not show what she looked like at the time. There's obviously a difference between a healthy photo that is given and one that was not so healthy. I just should say, though, whatever caused her to struggle at the time or any choices she made, she didn't deserve to die. And so many people turned their lives around later, she didn't get her chance. And obviously no one should end up in a marsh. 
Gail Marlene Johnson went unidentified for 23 years. Had she lived, she would be 63 years old today. The Loudoun County John Doe, identified as James Nuckles. In September of 1985, remains were found by what's just described as two juveniles who were riding their bikes along Buttermilk Road off Interstate 40 in Lenora City, Tennessee. Forensic anthropologists would examine the person and determine it was a white male between the ages of 40 and 57. He was a victim of a gunshot wound, and it was ruled to be foul play. According to the University of Tennessee Anthropology Department, he had passed either one week or two weeks prior to being found, so he hadn't been there very long. They tried to use fingerprints to determine his name, but in 1985, there was only so much you could do, and fingerprints tend to decompose. So a number of cases currently are rerunning some of those fingerprints through the system and getting actual matches, which frees up other cases for DNA. So it's a win-win sort of thing. But this change was pretty recent, so there's more and more coming through as jurisdictions begin to rerun them. So for 30 years, they didn't really know a whole lot about what had happened from 1985 to 2015, but they hadn't given up and they had been looking. And the TBI, or the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, would actually open it up again and try to take another look. This led to DNA getting into CODIS, but as is pretty normal, there wasn't a hit. What I find interesting in this case, though, is they ran the fingerprints after they had submitted DNA to Othram in Woodlands, Texas. They were able to trace the DNA down to a potential family member, believing they had identified James Keith Nuckles. But the interesting thing is they would then use the fingerprint to confirm him and offer a picture of what he looked like. James was born on October 15, 1926, and he was living in Tennessee and was 58 when his life was taken. So this is just part of the case. Keith still deserves justice. So if anyone knows anything about it, please call 1-800-TBI-FIND, and you can remain anonymous. James Keith Nuckles went unidentified for 38 years. He was found 44 miles or about 70 kilometers from where he went missing. If he was still alive today, he would be 96. The Phoenix Jane Doe, identified as Amelia Munez Loera. On November 21, 2004, in Phoenix, Arizona, there was a woman who was walking on 15th Street and Broadway Road, and it was here that she was hit by a vehicle that managed to take off and get away without checking on her or even taking any responsibility. They went ahead and examined her remains, but despite her face being identifiable, no one came forward with her name. I can't find any indication of a post-mortem photo online. That doesn't mean there isn't one, but when I was looking, I didn't see one. The link to the one I had found had been removed. And also, when I've tried to put them on my channel and provide some of those links, I had YouTube remove it. So I, I'm not sure exactly what to do about that, but I am going to keep trying to send you guys to the post-mortem if you're interested. But obviously, I don't show them on this channel. Sadly, it would take the DNA Doe Project and nearly two decades to identify her. Amelia is described as a Mexican national who was 41 years old when her life was taken. Her DNA was confusing to figure out as she hailed from an area that practices describe as intermarriage between related families over generations, meaning people somewhere within the tree, not necessarily close to her, close to present day, but they were related in some way probably living in a condensed area where they would intermarry. Because of this, the DNA matches become muddled in a way that isn't usually seen. The DNA Doe Projects mentions that this is a tradition in some areas, and because of that, it makes genetic genealogy difficult. Additionally, the DNA Doe Project would explain that cases involving recent immigrants can often take longer. Typically, those cases have fewer matches in the public databases like GEDmatch or FTDNA, which is another one they've been using more and more. But despite not finding anything, they didn't give up and they kept going. In the end, they spent over 1,300 hours digging into various public DNA trees, trying to search for proof of a woman that was missing that could, in fact, be our Jane Doe. 
and they ended up solving it this way with the assistance of Amelia's niece, who they eventually found and asked for a DNA sample. It was then uploaded to Family Tree DNA. And in one of the articles I found where there was a rundown on how many unidentified cases there are in the United States, and this is just the U.S., it's harder to find the cases in the other countries, or at least it is for me. I've tried adding more. So who knows how many, but there are 40,000 here in the U.S. unidentified John and Jane Doe's. In Arizona alone, they have over 2,000 that are awaiting identification. That is horrible. I had a hard time getting these group of cases together because there were so many and they kept getting new identifications and I was trying to catch up. And I thought it was going fast, but when you're looking at how many there are, I don't see how it's possible to ever give the number of people answers that need them. And in this case, in Arizona, I suspect there's probably a lot of them that have come here from Mexico. And this is not any sort of a judgment at all. So please know that I don't mean it that way. I had some cases I'd planned to present that were meant for people who passed away with photographs. And a lot of those ended up being people who had documentation and maybe passed away trying to cross over, found out in the desert, or obviously passing from many different ways here within the U.S. and not just in Arizona either. But as I started recording it, I got worried and I know you guys are amazing, and most people wouldn't, but I got worried there would be negative comments that the family might see. I've had family members comment on some of my videos, and I don't want to hurt anyone. I ended up stopping that one. I was afraid it would just become political and not about the people. Because no matter what happened to them or how they got here, somebody's family is missing someone, and someone no longer has a name. So as far as this channel is concerned, it doesn't matter how, where, or why. Anyway, as for Amelia's perpetrator, the police would state that they had closed the case on her hit and run, but they can always reopen it. So this one really is kind of at the mercy of someone calling in. They just need a tip. The odds are really against it. It just depends on if someone will call in. So someone can call in to secret witness and just give a name and what they know. They don't even have to give their own name. Amelia deserves justice. Amelia Munez Luera has gone unidentified for 18 years. Had she lived, she would be 59 years old today. Huge thanks for watching all the way to the end. And a big thanks to all of you who consistently like and comment on the videos. The whole dance with YouTube is hard sometimes. Whether you leave a full comment or an emoji, it makes a huge difference. It's a huge push toward the videos being suggested to new people. The next goal is 20,000. Thanks everyone for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other.